Welcome on in, Eagles fans, to a special hot take reaction episode of the No Huddle Show. I'm Joe Giglio, joined on these episodes, as always, by Elliot Shore Parks and Matt Lombardo. They cover the Eagles for NJ Advanced Media. They were at Luka Financial Field last game before the bye, which we're in the bye week right now. And the Eagles hang 51 points on a team, the Denver Broncos, that came in with the number one ranked defense in the NFL. We'll get to all your tweets, your reaction. We'll play a little fact or fiction as we look forward to uh, what should be a very exciting second half of the season for the best team in the NFL. Elliot, it's been a few days now. You guys had your post-game reaction. Um, you know, this week has kind of settled in. It's the bye week. And the Eagles, in the eyes, I think, of almost everyone around the NFL, are the best team in the sport through nine weeks. It, it's just incredible how good they've gotten over the last month, really. Yeah, I think a few times on the pod I've said, when you take a step back and just kind of look big picture here, if you would have told me they were going to be 8-1 and one at the bye week, I would have said you're crazy. I remember listening to 90-40 VIP with Ike Reese, and Ike was starting the season off with his win-loss prediction. He was like, win, win, win. And I'm like, get out of here. Like, that's not going to happen. And here we go. I mean, they're 8-1. and one. Um, Obviously, the second half of the schedule is a little tougher, but definitely winnable games. And I just think, I mean, over the, these last few days, kind of my takeaway has been there's been a lot of people trying to rationalize why they're maybe not that good or why their win over the Broncos, you know, wasn't as impressive as it is. But no, I mean, it's incredibly impressive what they're doing to put up 51 points um, on arguably the best defense in the NFL. And I think I I think things are only going to get better. I don't subscribe to the uh, idea that they're going to choke or that something's going to go wrong. Um, as long as Wentz stays healthy, I think this team, you know, they're not going to go four and three in their final seven games. They might lose another game, maybe two more at most. Um, but I think Eagles fans are should get ready for a really exciting second half of the season. They they should. I mean, this team is rolling now, Matt, and it's two weeks in a row. Then I mean, the, the Niners game. I don't think anyone expected it to be that close, even though with the weather. But last week, this past Sunday against the Broncos, to do what they did against that defense, it almost looked easy for them. Yeah, it was amazing. And two weeks in a row in the month of November, guys, they've rested their starters in the fourth quarter. Nick Foles has played close to a quarter of football each of the last two weeks. And Carson Wentz still threw for four touchdowns against the number one defense in the league with the Denver Broncos last Sunday. So I couldn't be more impressed in what they're doing right now. And they have the luxury of the bye week where you're probably going to get Ronald Darby healthy going into Dallas. You're going to be able to, you know, rest up. Everybody's hurting this time of year. Last year, the Eagles had the bye in week four. This year, they kind of have the benefit of, you know, recharging their batteries halfway through the year. Uh, I, I think that the second half of the season is going to be much more interesting. I think that the schedule is significantly tougher the rest of the way. And I think that this eight and one cushion is going to serve the Eagles well, because I think there is a chance that they could lose as many as three games in the second half of the year. I know that we'll debate it and we'll get into it, but I, I just think that they're playing some of the best football in the league right now, but they've had the benefit of playing outside of Denver and outside of Kansas City, uh, some competition that they should have taken care of business again. So kudos to them. They haven't slipped to date. And even if they lose three losses, lose three games the rest of the way, I don't think that's a failure. I don't think that's something going wrong. I just think that the second half is a much more difficult stretch than they played in the first half. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, and I guess we'll figure out and see how many games they lose and how they lose them. If they only have two losses down the stretch and then sit guys in week 17, they lose that one. Um, probably different than if they lose three, they're really trying to win. Let's no get doubt. to our first, let's get to our first uh, Twitter reaction here from at DJ underscore Hardy uh, 009. And um, he said in the playoffs, we'll look forward a little bit here because I feel like we could do that, which is amazing with, with the team that we weren't sure could be anything close to this. In the playoffs, who is the bigger threat? Saints, Seahawks, or someone else? Hashtag the no huddle. So, Elliot, if you look at the playoff picture heading into now, right, if the season ended today, the Seahawks wouldn't be there. Though I think mm -hmm. a lot of people, maybe all of us included, would say the Seahawks would be a threat if they do find their way in. But they're not in that picture right now. Who are you looking at underneath the Eagles that you say that would be an intriguing game or that's a threat? I think without question, and I know Matt disagrees with this because we've debated this in the press room, but I think without question, the biggest threat to the Eagles making the Super Bowl is the Seattle Seahawks. Because, you know, people talk about, well, should the Eagles should be should they be favorited to make the Super Bowl? Are they the best team in the NFL? And I think the answer to both those questions is no. I don't think they should be favored to go to the Super Bowl. I don't think they're the best team in the NFL because 
I look at it come playoff time, the things that they have, the thing, the thing they don't have that everyone, that a lot of other teams will is playoff experience. Cause see the Seahawks have it. The saints have it. The Cowboys have it. The Rams don't, but I don't view the Rams as a legitimate threat. So if you look at those three teams, when you break them all down, the saints and Seahawks both have a good offense, but I think it's the Seahawks defense that makes them the biggest threat to the Eagles. Cause they have, the best defense among those teams. They have not the best quarterback because Drew Brees is probably better than Russell Wilson, but they have a, play, a Super Bowl winning quarterback and they have playoff experience. So I think assuming the Eagles finish with the number one record, and I think they, they probably will, or at most will be number two, I think they're more than likely going to avoid a trip to New Orleans, which means I think come playoff time, they'll beat the Saints in Philly. But I don't think I would pick them to beat the Seahawks in Philly or in Seattle. Um, You know, we'll see how the second half of the season plays out. But as of now, if the Seahawks came to Philadelphia, I would pick them to beat the Eagles. And if the Eagles go to Seattle and come playoff time, I'd pick them to lose. So I think that those are the only two games other than going to New Orleans that could really knock the Eagles out come playoff time. It's funny, you know, that game that just happened this past Sunday, right, as you guys were wrapping up um, at the link, the the Redskins in Seattle against uh, the Seahawks. That really helped the Eagles, I, I thought, because Kirk Cousins went down and, and won that game, Matt, and it gave the Seahawks their third loss, which I'm not saying it's over. There's a lot of that season left, but if you're kind of projecting ahead to who gets the number one seed, and, and now Seattle's not even in the playoff picture, but if they do get there, that loss hurt. I agree with Elliot with a lot of what he said about the Seahawks, their track record, Russell Wilson, Pete Carroll, but they, there is something a little weird about them this year. They don't stop the run, run the ball as well as they used to. Matt, I know you've been high on the Rams, and... Uh, you know, they're emerging as a team that, I mean, clearly they have to be part of this conversation because they're putting up as many points as the Eagles are basically every week. Yeah, no, I agree. And Jared Goff is a legitimate top 10 to top 15 quarterback in this league right now. They have a really good defense. And Sean McVay is, I think, authoring a resume that's as strong for coach of the year as Doug Peterson is. But if you're just asking me how I would handicap the NFC playoffs, guys, I think the Eagles right now, as of today, I think they're the favorite to win the conference. But if you talk to me December 1st, I think we might have a totally different outlook on this thing based on what's going to happen when you go out to Seattle, when you go out to L.A. Joe, I agree. I don't think the Seahawks are quite the same. But if the Eagles have to go to Seattle for an NFC championship game, going back there twice, going back there three times in two years, I still think that's a grueling environment. It's one of the toughest places to play. Russell Wilson in the postseason is still a quarterback with experience. Drew Brees, I think, is a threat anywhere. And my concern is that the Eagles stumble and lose both of those West Coast games, and you wind up having to go to Los Angeles, having to go to Seattle for an NFC championship game. And I don't know if this team is ready to take care of business on the road. The only team that I think I'd pick the Eagles to lose to, both home or away, would be the Saints. I mean, they've won six in a row. Drew Brees is getting better every week. Uh, He's finally starting to you know, come to grips with an offense that doesn't have Brandon Cooks. And that defense is finding its footing a lot quicker than a lot of people expected it to after an offseason with a lot of changes. So if I were worried, if I were putting my hierarchy of worry, the top three teams that I think Eagles fans and the Eagles should worry about are the Saints, number one, Seattle, number two, and the Rams are right there in that mix. The NFC is pretty good. I think it's better top to bottom than the AFC. I mean, the AFC has the Patriots, it has the Steelers, the Chiefs, all really good teams. But you look at the conference, I mean, the Seahawks aren't in the playoffs right now. And we, we all agree they're a good team and a threat if they do get there. So the NFC is deep right now. Eagles are on top of it. All right, at Kyle McCloskey. Well, I'm sorry, can I just say, can I say one more thing before we move sure. on? Um, sure, sure. So as much as I think, and I think we all agree, the Eagles are going to be a playoff team and they could finish with number one seed. It is worth mentioning they play the Rams, they play the Seahawks, they play the Cowboys, Mm -hmm. and it's very likely that a team with 10 wins could miss the playoffs this year. So I do think they're going to finish with that top seed, but I mean, if the Eagles don't take care of business against those three teams, they could be fighting for a playoff spot come like week 15, week 16, which is crazy to think because they're eight and one. But because the way their schedule works out and playing all those teams on the road, I know they get the Cowboys at home as well in week 17, but I don't think it's going to fall apart, like I said, but this isn't like the Eagles are going to have to take care of business. This is not going to be a cakewalk to the finish line for them. And the fact they play those opponents we just talked about makes these games even more important. It's true. It's weird with the way the schedule is. It feels like they could lose all the big games and still make it, but it would leave no confidence heading into the playoffs because they still have the Bears. They have the Raiders at home. They have the Giants. You would think if they win those three games, 
they're in at 11 wins. But if they lose all the other ones, which means two Cowboy games, Seattle, Los Angeles, I don't think anyone's going to feel good um, heading into the playoffs. So Kyle said Eagles will be 10 and one post Thanksgiving, 14 and two at the end of the year, unless they sit everyone final game high at the high point, And then they will be 13 and three. Elliot, when you look ahead and you were kind of just doing it here, I mean, where do you think this thing ends? I mean, before the season, I said 10, and then I started to move it up to 11 just because they kept winning. Uh, and now at 8-1, and one, I think 12 is more than realistic, and 13-3 and three is not hard to imagine considering they're already 8-1. and one. So if I just were to pick the remaining games, just like win-loss, win-loss, I would have them finishing 14-2 and two because the only game I'm going to pick them to lose, barring injury, is – Going to Seattle. I think they're going to beat the Cowboys. They'll beat the Bears. I really don't see the Rams thing. I mean, Matt, you're saying he's a top 10 quarterback, Jared Goff. I just really – top 10-ish, not top 10-ish. Well, how, how much I, have you watched him? Well, I mean, I'm, I, I'll am i admit I haven't watched him a ton. I don't know how much you've watched him. But before this game, he only had nine touchdowns in seven games. I know they're putting up points, and touchdowns aren't the end-all, be-all. He trashed a bad Giants defense. But I just don't think that – the, the Rams belong in that. I mean, look, maybe I'll be proven wrong. I His just passer don't... rating is only eight points lower than Wentz. And you look at yardage. But Wentz has 23, 23 touchdowns. Right. But you look at yardage. He only has 200 yards less than Wentz. His mm. completion percentage is actually higher than Carson Wentz's on the year. So I, if you think Carson Wentz is a top three or top four quarterback, and you look at what Jared Goff is doing in Los Angeles, and I don't know how you can say that he's a middling quarterback if you're that high on what Wentz is doing. Like, Well, I, I think the argument could be there's just not a lot of good quarterbacks. So maybe he's, you know, top 10, top 12 just because of that. But Jared Goff is still not a guy where if I'm an opposing team, I'm worried about playing him, in my opinion. I mean, you so look at these- four picks and they've come in three games. I mean, I, I just... I, I just look at what Goff is doing, and, and I've watched him play. He looks like a completely different quarterback than he did a year ago. He threw two picks against Seattle. He threw uh, one interception against the Redskins and one early on in week two against the uh, the Cardinals. He's at 110 or higher passer rating three times, mm-hmm. two of them above 145. I, I just look at what he's doing, and I'm impressed with the way that he's turned around his career from last year. And I don't know how many quarterbacks are putting up the kind of production that he is already. And going there with a defense like the Rams, who they're a solid defense with a really good pass rush. They have Todd Gurley at running back. They have Goff. I just think they have all of the ingredients, especially coming off a week prior, the Eagles being in Seattle, where I don't think you I think the Eagles could walk into that game either being a three point favorite or a three point underdog. That's not that's not a a mismatch by any stretch of the imagination. I think they're a team that the Eagles could wind up seeing at some point in the postseason this year. Yeah, and I think the Eagles, I mean, staying that week in California, coming off the Seattle law, the Seattle game, which I think is going to be a loss. I mean, I'm, I don't think they're going to get smoked or anything, but I think they probably will lose to the Seahawks up there. I think going to the Rams is going to be a tough spot. But if the Rams come to Philadelphia in the playoffs, I think it, it won't even be a contest. I think the Eagles take care of them pretty, pretty easily. Um, but, you know, I mean... We'll see. I just think I think the difference between I understand what you're saying about if if Wentz is top three, then how much further down can Goff be? I just think that the difference between a top three quarterback and what Wentz is doing is just like astronomical from from what Goff is doing. Just looking at his games. I mean, he's only got he's got two, three games this year where he's thrown over two touchdowns or two or more. So, I mean, he's not really – I understand his, his passer rating and all that, but I think you can look and say Wentz is carrying the Eagles, where Goff, I think, just if you look at his stats, and I will admit I haven't watched him a ton, does seem like he's more game managing. I, I think that that's selling him a little bit short, to be honest. But, I mean, look, if, if, you don't, if you're not buying in, I guess we'll see when they play uh, the Eagles and you get to watch them firsthand – um, I, I just look at what he's doing. He threw four, four touchdowns on Sunday. I know the Giants have, have cratered, but, you know, the passer rating above 145 twice a year, that's pretty impressive to me. Three times over 110. He has the 98 passer rating against the Cowboys. They, they've taken care of business. And if you want to say that Jared Goff is a game manager, there's some reason that the Rams are, what are they now, 5-2? and two? There's some reason why they're 5-2 and two if Jared Goff is just a game manager. And I think you have to get the tip of the hat to the defense, a tip of the hat to Todd Gurley. And I just think that those two teams in a playoff situation, home field is going to make a world of difference. I agree. Playoff In the playoffs this year, home field advantage 
is going to be key because the Eagles are really tough to play at home. The Saints are tough to play in New Orleans. A trip to, out to L.A. is not going to be fun for anybody except the beat writers. So I, I agree that home field advantage is going to be huge. I just think that the Eagles are – like the, the Saints and the Seahawks and the Cowboys have something that the Rams and the Eagles don't, which is playoff experience. But I think when you look at the Eagles and the Rams, I think the Eagles have the far better quarterback – um, the Rams might, might have the better coach, but I think it's that's close. And I think the Eagles' defense is better, even though the Rams' defense is comparable. But I think you can compare those two. I just think Wentz is going to be the difference um, when they play. And I, I don't think in the playoffs the, the, the Rams would beat the Eagles. I'm kind of rooting for this game in the playoffs. I mean, we're going to see it, I guess, week 14. Yeah. Um, and you guys mentioned the, the back-to-back West Coast games. But it's just a lot there. It's fun. I mean, they, were, they became the first time in history this past Sunday where the number one and number two picks that were quarterbacks – threw four touchdowns each on the same day. They're both playing well wherever they're ranked. I mean, they're having good seasons. The coaches are new and interesting and offensive minds. I think it would be a – and the Connor Barwin thing with him out there, with the, I think it would be a fun uh, playoff game if we, uh, if we do get it uh, in, in January. All right, let's go to uh, Coco, at the real Coco G on Twitter, at the No Huddle Show, tweeted us, hypothetically – and this is an interesting question because it could probably change week to week – but – Hypothetically, who could the Eagles least afford to lose now besides Wentz, obviously? Hashtag the No Huddle Show. And he, all, he threw in the question mark, Alshon. I wasn't, I'm not, not sure if that was for you, Elliot, or just for I mean, uh, if that's really joke. what he thought. Um, I, I, that's tough. I mean, taking I Wentz out. I think it's out, an easy one, guys. I think it's an easy one. I think it's Lane Johnson. Yeah, I, I think I, that that's you've already lost Jason Peters, and Lane Johnson right now – He's receiving the least amount of help of any offensive tackle in the league, meaning he's on an island more than any left tackle, any right tackle in football. And that's because he's dominating. And you look at what he did against Von Miller. There's a clip that I tweeted out where he pancaked him. I mean, he got pushed back a little bit with a, bu- a bull rush from Von Miller, but then he put him on his, on his ass. He, he pancaked him. There's another play where Miller tried an outside rush. And Jeff Stoutland said that it was perfectly executed technique when with his left hand, even though Lane Johnson's right-handed, he took one hand and threw Von Miller to the ground. So the way that he played against Von Miller – I think that underscores the all pro caliber season that Lane Johnson is having. And we look at last year, how much the Eagles struggled without Lane Johnson. Yes, they took care of business when he sat out against the Carolina Panthers on that Thursday night game. But I think if you were to lose Lane for a extended stretch now, after having lost Jason Peters, I think it decimates your offensive line and it changes everything about the offense. So this is a layup for me. The one player that they can least afford to lose is Lane Johnson. Yeah, I agree. Um, the second place I would say, though, might be Malcolm Jenkins, just because the depth at safety is so bad and he does so much for him. But, yeah, I mean, that's an easy one. It's definitely Lane for, for sure. I mean, because you don't want to ever think about putting – the only thing scarier than putting Isaac Samalu out of tackle would be the fact that Taylor Hart would then be the top backup. So if they lost Lane, things could get really ugly really quick. The the clip, Matt, that you mentioned, of uh, specifically, specifically the one that Stoutland commented on of Lane Johnson, it's it's one of the most ridiculous videos you'll see if you watch right? film or just watch <laughs> a highlight. Not, not only because he does it to him, because you realize the guy he's doing it to is the best pass rusher in the NFL and has been since he walked in the league in 2011. Like, he just took Von Miller and threw him to the ground as if it was some sort of scripted wrestling move. Yeah, it was unbelievable. And Lane has really done a nice job this year, I think, of, you know, getting motivated. And I think that he hears some of the criticism from opposing players. And he's talked about, you know, guys trash talking about the suspension. And I know that there were some analysts saying some things that, you know, Von Miller was going to dominate that one on one matchup between the two of them on Sunday. And he's channeled that into his play. And the Eagles are pretty fortunate when you look at what they've gotten from that whole right side of the line. Jason Kelsey at center having a career year. They're going to really have to make a decision on him in the offseason. Brandon Brooks is playing at a really high level, particularly when it comes to run blocking. And Lane Johnson might be the best tackle. Forget right tackle, maybe the best tackle in all of football. So you look at what they're getting from that right side. It's really kind of mitigated the loss of Jason Peters at left. And J- Stefan Wisniewski taking over for Isaac Sayamalu at left guard has been a little bit of a godsend. But that right side of the offensive line anchored by Lane has been I think an underrated reason why this offense has been as successful as it's been this year. Uh, Let's talk about Alshon for a second. A couple tweets about him. uh, One in the last tweet. And then uh, O'Brien, 94 on Twitter, said Alshon and Wentz look to be getting on the same page. Offense looks more explosive. Elliot, I know you wrote to start this week 
about Alshon and his contract, which is obviously up after the season, a one-year deal, and how it kind of changes week to week, the decision the Eagles might have to make. What do you think of, of Alshon? Now, that was clearly his best game. He seems to be – I've noticed the last two weeks a little bit more, I don't know, burst or explosion. He just looks better than he did earlier mm-hmm. in the season. Uh, the numbers in totality are not great. He's clearly having a good impact on the offense. What do you think uh, watching Alshon kind of as the season has now progressed? Well, I remember sitting in the press box with Matt during that game. This was before he caught his second touchdown and saying, with Alshon this season, it seems to always be like he makes a play and then, you know, something either has a penalty or a drop. And I mean, he played very well against the Broncos. But my counter would be, I mean, he's he's on pace to have a good year. You mentioned his numbers. Um, I have it right here. I think he's on pace for like 10 touchdowns and, you know, like almost a thousand yards, 888 yards. So he could finish with with good numbers. And I think his last seven games are going to be more productive than his first first nine. But I still think you're seeing a number two wide receiver. Um, He drops the ball. His two touchdowns against the Broncos. I think if you rank like why those touchdowns happened, you put Wentz and Doug Peterson ahead of Alshon there. I thought the first one, I mean, he he sold the the fake. He helped to sell the fake, but he, it's not like he jumped up and and just outmanned a, a, a Talib. And then on the second one, he wasn't touched either, and it was an amazing throw by Wentz. So I agree with you. It's good to see Carson and Alshon getting on the same page. This is the highest completion percentage that Carson's had this year, targeting Alshon, where he's caught four or more passes. So you know the fact that he wasn't even the, against the Niners last week. Um, I think he was two of seven targeting Alshon or something like that. So he was six of 11 this week, I believe. Um, so it's an improvement. Um, I'm just still not ready, as a lot of people are, to say, well, Alshon's getting ready to explode just because I think I think he still just is what he is, a number two wide receiver. The calisthenics you do when it comes to Alshon Jeffrey, I I think they're hysterical, man, because you say that he's Straight a number facts. two wide receiver, and <laughs> he's obviously this team's number one wide receiver. I don't think there's a receiver on this team. You, you can talk about Nelson Aguilar, but we saw Aguilar struggle last year on the outside, and you can talk about the numbers for Alshon Jeffrey. I don't think we can dismiss two things here. Number one, this is his first year with Carson Wentz and Wentz in his second season. And I think all three of us would agree that Wentz's arc in this season has been pretty much a straight line from week one. That if you go back and you watch the tape from the Redskin game and you watch the tape from the Bronco game, he's deadlier with the, the deep ball. He's more accurate consistently to the outside than he was back in week one. And he's playing a much more confident brand of football. And at the same time, you're seeing that chemistry develop between these two who have only been on the same team for nine games at this stage. So the fact that already through nine games, Jeffrey's on pace to tie or exceed an average season with the Bears where he was for five seasons, I think that gives you all the reason in the world to be optimistic. And secondly, without Zach Ertz on Sunday, who was Wentz's security blanket, it kind of forced him to target the outside more because, yeah, Trey Burton and Brent Selleck did a nice job, but they weren't breaking open as consistently as Ertz was, and that wasn't the fallback option with Ertz not being in there. So you saw Wentz get more comfortable throwing to Jeffrey, and I thought that play fake on the run pass option on the first touchdown was brilliant. And we talked about it after the game. Was the play brilliant or was Alshon brilliant? Well, I think it was a a combination of all three because number one, Wentz and Ajayi selling the play fake for as long as they did and sucking in the defense to the point where Wentz could roll out and throw him. But Jeffrey sold it as a run early in that route pretty well. And then he broke open and Wentz threw him further open on the run. And those are the type of plays that Alshon Jeffrey makes. I don't know that Torrey Smith Smith makes them. I don't know that Matt Collins makes them. And I don't know that Nelson Aguilar would make that kind of play. And as we what kind of play? He was wide open. But he broke open because he sold the run fake early on. And it's not like he was 15 yards behind the the cornerback. And even if he was, that's a credit to Alshon for getting that wide open, is it not? But my my but my point is, if I'm going to pay a guy nine and a half million dollars, I need him to do a lot more than just sell the fake good at the beginning of a play. Because I think I, I disagree with you. I think if you put any other almost any other receiver in the positions Alshon were against the Broncos on those two touchdowns, they they both both those plays still result in touchdowns. Maybe not Torrey Smith because his hands have been a little inconsistent, but Alshon's hands have been inconsistent too. I mean, I think you could probably tally him for three drops last Sunday. So, so if he winds up with 1,100 yards and 10 touchdowns, I would bring offer? him back. I would bring him back. 
But my point is this. I think that when you look at why the Eagles offense is successful this year, the play of the wide receivers is extremely far down the list. Would you agree with that? I well, think right, Carson- because I don't think that this offense, at least not through the first nine games, I, I don't think it's fully utilizing the outside receivers because the quarterback doesn't they don't target need- the outside receivers as frequently as he does the slot and the tight end. But I guess what I'm saying is I think well, we would both agree that Doug has done a good job play calling and play designing this year. Would you agree with that? Sure. All right, He's done an excellent job. Right. So I guess my point is if you look at like the best teams in the league and the best quarterbacks in the league, very rarely do those teams pay top dollar to a wide receiver. I guess you could say Atlanta, uh, you know, obviously with Julio Jones. But I think when you New England have, made a trade for Brandon Cooks and they get right, what well, they, they give up, they, Joe, they give up a second round pick. Yeah, but they didn't pay him. And that's also one year out of how many. I mean, him and Randy Moss, I guess. And Edelman's good. I mean, although he's a slot receiver. So if to Eagles fans, that means he's, he's nothing. But <laughs> um, I guess my point is this. Like, yeah, I and I, I said in my article earlier this week, if it's going to cost six, seven million dollars a year, I, w- I would bring Alshon back because I think he I agree with you that you can see that in year two with Ertz and Aguilar, the improvement of playing with Wentz for a long amount of time does help. I think Alshon's a good guy. I think all those things. But my point is, if Alshon's going to cost you nine and a half, ten million dollars against the cap for four years, I think you could replace what he does. I mean, he's been targeted 73 times this year or something like that. How many times would you say he legitimately went up and, and and made an amazing and like went up and, and showed a catch that a number one receiver makes the majority of his catches have been I think, I think that we need to stop this terminology of number one receiver and start using the terminology elite receiver because do I think that he's in the category of a Julio Jones or an Odell Beckham Jr. or a Des Bryant or one of those top three or four receivers in the league no but I think that he is by skill set and by the attention that gets paid to him by opposing defenses and, and just by production He's a number one wide receiver on over half of the teams in the NFL, including Maybe. the. I mean, I, I, I don't even think. Look, like he's the number one outside receiver on this team, but he's not their number one. If you if you include tight ends and like you know slot well, sure. receivers, Zach, and Zach Ertz is their most prolific receiver, and that's largely because a he's one of the top two or three tight ends in football, so he has that elite status. And number two, this quarterback in this offense funnel the ball through the middle of the field significantly more than that they do to the outside. But so I, I guess what I'm saying is you you always I, say that, I'm but then why do you want that? To, is that they have that outside option that teams are are putting the best cornerback on and paying attention to. Whereas last year, Ertz put up good numbers, but they weren't all pro top tier tight end in the league numbers. And you're seeing the impact that Jeffrey has based on what's happening underneath. I'm not disagreeing that Alshon has some impact on Ertz, but I think people, I think people are vastly overrating the fact that Ertz is just Ertz and Wentz are just better this year together. Now, look, maybe in 2018, Right. Maybe Alshon has a breakout year if he's back because he has more experience with Wentz. But my point is, nobody told me in training camp when he signed like, okay, well, it's going to take, you know, 10 or 11 games for them to get on the same page. I didn't hear any of that. I heard a lot of like, well, he's going to die. What does that matter? In the the big picture, what's that matter? What you heard in August? It it doesn't. It doesn't matter. I guess what I'm saying is that. Like this is this is just who he is. Like he he's gonna he he's not. You you said it perfectly. He's it, whether we're using elite or number one. He's not an elite elite receiver. So it comes down to cap space. Like I I said I would bring that back Alshon, but I mean, would you pay him ten million a year? If they, if that's what the market bears, yeah, I'd probably pay him ten million a year. So but you I don't would think pay I'd go whatever it higher. takes to get him back, barring you know something absolutely crazy. Like if. Well, if- he, if, if, if let's say uh, the Cleveland Browns come in and offer $14, 15000000 million, I say, hey, thanks for the good year, Alshon Jeffrey, and good luck. But if you can get him for $10 million, which I think is going to be fairly reasonable based on the other receivers on the market, absolutely, because I don't think that you can give Carson Wentz that kind of a weapon and then take him away and go back to Matt Collins and go back to Nelson Aguilar playing on the outside and not having that dominant number one presence on the outside. Well, well, because next thing you know, you got to draft a top wide receiver, and you don't have the picks to do that. Well, I, I think just know I think Eagles this will continue, are, are guys. Projected. Let me say one thing, Joe. Sorry, the Eagles only have or project to have around twelve million. Now I know cap space and how it can work with contracts and cuts and all that, but you're talking about a large portion of your cap space going to a guy that I think is not easily replaceable, but a guy that has not shown me that he deserves that top tier money. It feels like what Matt said a few minutes ago is probably the best way to describe Alshon. He's he's good. Uh, whether you want to call him a one or whatever, he's a he's a good 
wide receiver, but he's not elite. And I don't know how we where the line of demarcation comes. I don't know where we we draw that line and say, oh, this guy's elite, this guy isn't. This is always a weird conversation in any sport. But right now there are 12 wide receivers or 12 pass catchers because uh, Rob Gronkowski is part of this mix. 12 have 70 or more yards per game. Uh, Alshon is not in that mix, but 12 do. He ranks 31st in the NFL at 55 yards per game this year. Um, he's around guys like Michael Crabtree, uh, Sterling Shepard. Des Bryant is actually in that mix, even though Des is obviously a very good receiver. This is, I mean, it's a small sample. It's eight, nine games for these teams. But And I call all the, all of the, the at least those three that you mentioned, I would say that they're number one wide receivers. Or, or Michael Crabtree? Number, yeah. Okay. All right. That's fine. I was just I, – I, I think I would disagree, but I'll be honest. I'd have to look up more about him. But I'll, I don't think of him as a number one type guy. This is about money. I mean, Alshon's a hey, good yeah, player. Well, that's the other thing too. I mean, we can throw stats and everything. But at the end of the day, we're going to find out how much Eagles value Alshon, how much other teams value Alshon based off the money. Money, and yeah. yeah Crabtree that- has six touchdowns and 450 yards, and he's averaging 13 yards a catch. I mean, that's – to me – through eight games, a guy with six touchdowns and 450 yards. I'd say that's pr- pretty close to number one territory. Yeah, I mean, maybe. I, I don't want to debate Michael Crabtree. But I guess m- m- what I was going to say is, I mean, even last offseason, then we can move on to the next question. If you, I mean, I could talk Alshon all day. But, um, I mean, he only got a one-year deal, $9.5 million. So, you know, I, I think that, that speaks for itself a little bit. And we'll see this offseason. And, again, I would re-sign Alshon for the right price. I'm not saying he's like a detriment, any of that. I'm just saying I think we can all agree he came here to prove himself, to to land a top deal over multiple years. And I think up to this point, if we're talking about an elite wide receiver contract, you know, $10, 11 $12 million a year, that's not something I'm willing to pay for Alshon. That, that's that, where I stand. That's where I – That's the, this is the only place me and Matt disagree on, honestly, I think. Like Matt's willing to pay whatever, almost whatever it takes to get him. I'm not. That's the only thing. I think in terms of the actual player, I think we're probably closer on the same page than it sounds. It's just I don't think it's worth committing that much cap space to him. Yeah, I think that's fair. And then we'll find out if the Eagles – um, feel the same way or how they feel, especially with a scheme that seems to be rolling here. And maybe they just think Doug could scheme it up and they bring another Alshon in and they get a lot of production. We'll see when this season ends. All right, let's do a little fact or fiction on this Eagles team as we move forward here. Eight and one by week here. Uh, we'll do fact or fiction and we have four of these. Uh, we'll play out between now and the end of the season. Elliot, we'll start with you. Fact or fiction. The Eagles will enter the postseason as the number one seed in the NFC and the Super Bowl. The road to the Super Bowl goes through Philadelphia. That's a tough one. I'm going to say fact, just because I think they beat the Cowboys twice. I think they split with Seattle and L.A. Um, the Saints, I mean, that's out of their control. But I think if the Eagles finish with, with you know, three losses, three, yeah, three losses, and then they go five and two over their last seven, I think – Three losses will get them the number one seed. So I'm going to say fact. I'm going to go fact too, Matt, before you give yours. I mean, they are undefeated in the NFC. They're already 8-1. and They're really good at home, which makes me think they're going to beat the Bears. They'll beat the Cowboys if they need that game. They'll probably beat the Raiders. That's 11 before anything else they have to accomplish. I think it's going to be 13-3 and in the top seed in the conference. I think they're going to go somewhere in the area of – I think there's a chance they go 13-3 and and wind up as the two seed. To All right, who do you think is going to finish one? To either Seattle or LA. Because I that, think would that, Seattle, that would mean Seattle wins out. Well, I'd have to look at their schedule. And well, I, I, mean, I, think, I just mean they're five and three. So yeah. if that, that they can only get to 13 and three. Okay. Well, unless they look at the Rams, I think there's a chance the Rams wind up as the number one seed. They're, they're now six and two. They've had their bye week. They play the Eagles out there. Listen, that's a grueling stretch to play the Rams. After going to Seattle, that, that's a tough spot for any team. And that might be a must win, win situation for the Eagles. I could be. I'm it's excited for this Rams team. game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. Well, it'll be a fun podcast after that Rams game. Either I'll be proven wrong or Matt will, but it'll be. Do you imagine a- having this conversation before the year? Like we're talking about the Eagles Rams. God, yeah, that's the crazy. Yeah, exactly. It's a number, you know, potentially the number one seat on the line of the NFC. It's things change uh, fast. All right. Uh, number two. Fact or fiction, Elliot, Carson Wentz will be named the 2017 NFL MVP. He's even right now in the eyes of Bavada odds. Well, if I think they're going to finish with number one seed in the NFC, I think it's a fact. Um, first of all, the fact he's a quarterback obviously helps. 
Um, I think he'll be the popular choice. I think he'll be the fun choice for a lot of people. Um, if things keep going the way they are, I mean, obviously it's, it's possible he could dip, but if things keep going the way they are, then, then I think, uh, I think he will be NFL MVP. Matt, the odds right now have a lot of quarterbacks. It's Wentz, it's Brady, uh, Wilson's towards the, the end of that list as well. Um, I'm sure Goff, if he keeps playing well, will get himself in the mix. Do you think Wentz wins the MVP? I think at this point, he's a stone lock to win the MVP. I mean, he's the first quarterback to 23 touchdowns. He has that element of extending plays that produce those highlight reels that stick in the mind of MVP voters. I just look at what he's doing, and Elliot said it earlier on the podcast that the Eagles are winning largely because of Carson Wentz. He's been the driving force. And if they're one of the top two seeds in the NFC, and you look at what he was as a rookie compared to what he is right now, I don't know how you cast a ballot for anybody else. You can make a case for Drew Brees. You can look at Tom Brady and say that even at the age of 40, his play isn't tailing off even a little bit. But I look at Wentz. I look at his impact on the Eagles this season. And they've been the top story in the NFL in addition to being the most dominant team. So I think Carson Wentz runs away with the MVP race when all is said and done. And and re- really quick, there's this thing on, on, on Twitter. It seems I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just because there's a large Eagles falling on Twitter. But... There's nothing that gets people on Twitter, Eagles fans, more mad than when someone rips on Wentz. And this week, it was uh, it was Scott Caxmere. I'm sorry, football I'm outsiders. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name, and I respect him. I'm, I'm you know, not, but to me, it's just funny at this point. If you're trying to discredit what Wentz is doing, like you're clearly not watching. And I, and I'm just saying this as someone that's seen every throw Wentz has made this season, basically every throw since he's been drafted. This team is eight and one almost solely because of Carson Wentz. If if Nick Foles is in there, if anybody but like two or three other quarterbacks in the NFL are in there, they are not eight and one. I mean, you know, you can point to, you can really pick obscure stats. You can do whatever you want. But if Wentz is not the quarterback of this team, they are like maybe, I don't know, three and five. Like they, they are not a good team. Wentz makes everything go with this team. And I think he completely changes the atmosphere. And that's and to, you know, the people that don't cover the team, that's tough to see from far away, which is why I'm, I'm not blaming them or ripping them. But it's just silly to me that some people are still trying to pick apart Wentz's game when he's so clearly the reason they're the best record-wise. They're, they're the best team in the NFL. Yeah, it's a very I agree, strange, but, I, I don't think, but I don't think there's a significant drop-off from Carson Wentz to Dak Prescott to Jared Goff. I, I think that all three have a chance when we look back on a three- or four-year stretch looking forward here – all three have a chance to be the top three quarterbacks in the NFL. And I think the battles moving forward between Wentz and Prescott and Goff, and eventually maybe you throw Marcus Mariota into that mix. Those are going to be looked at similarly to the way that we look back on Brady versus Manning. I think that these guys are all that good and Wentz very well might be the best of the bunch, but I don't think that the discrepancy between the three is this big chasm that some Eagles fans think that it is. They're all really good quarterbacks. And here's the news guys. That's great for the league. Anytime you have quarterbacks that are playing at that level and you have teams that can be that competitive, passing the torch from the Brady's and the breezes and the Roethlisberger, that's one of the great things for football. And one of the great things for a league that needs something to hope for in the future, because the future for the NFL in general, I think is, has never been cloudier, but these quarterbacks are kind of that great white hope. And the Man, NFL do I, do too, I disagree? Because... I disagree with you on Goff, but still, we we can go ahead. I just I think Dak and Mariota and Wentz are are a class above him right now. But, but is, I agree. Is, it, is it just because of what you saw from Goff last year in the conversation about Goff? I mean, what is it when when you watch him and when you look at the numbers and you look at their offense? What is it that you're not? What what do you not see? What do you need to see more? I don't. I, I mean. I, like I said, just from looking at his stats and from seeing what I've seen on Twitter and highlights and stuff like that. I mean, I'll admit I didn't, I haven't watched Rams all 22 tape, but I just think he is more of a game manager than the other three. I think Dak this year has proven, look, you, you were, you were telling me about Dak last year and I agree. Dak is, I think Wentz is still probably slightly better, but I think they're very comparable. I think Mariota is, is very good. I just think Goff is not on that level yet of being a guy that I can look at and say he can carry me to a win where I think those other three are capable of doing so. The interesting part about all three, the ones you brought up, Matt, and, and we're going to watch this evolve as the years go on. I feel all three now, it's not take anything away from them. I mean, once I agree with you guys, this is the MVP. Uh, Dak's good. Goff's had an incredible year. I think they're all the product of good coaching as well. Um, and, and obviously, Dak has had a good scheme around him and a good running game. I think McVay's great. I, you know, got you guys know, I think Doug is really good at what he does. So 
I think they're boosted by that. We're going to find out as the years go on how much their talent, you know, kind of pushes past that because they have coaching now. But if they also have this talent, which I think they all do, um, it's going to be fun. And that was all the one draft class. That was all last year's draft class. And no one yep. really was excited about it. You know, it was Goff and Wentz and Dak. No one talked about it. And and here we are now. All right. A couple more factor fiction before we wrap up. The e- factor fiction, Elliot, the Eagles will beat the Dallas Cowboys twice this season, starting uh, in week number, what is it, 11? Yeah, week 11. I think that's fact, too. I, I even Every time I've ever done a game-by-game prediction with this this year's team, I've done fact. Um, I even made a bet with Matt that the Cowboys wouldn't win seven or, seven or more games. So I'm just not big on the Cowboys. Obviously, I've been proven – I think I'll be end up proving wrong about the seven games. But I think the Eagles almost beat them in Dallas last year. I think this is an Eagles team that – is really capable of stepping up in big spots and takes things really personally. And I think they're going to go into Dallas thinking about the loss last year, thinking about sending a statement off a of bye week, prime time, divisional game. I think they win that game. And then week 17, I mean, that's tough because you don't know what it'll, what it'll mean. But if it means anything, I don't see the Cowboys. If it means anything to the Eagles, I don't see the Cowboys coming in and beating them in Philadelphia. Matt, your thoughts? Two Cowboy games starting a couple Sundays from right now. I'm going to say it's a fa. I'm not going to go fact because, like oh, Elliot said, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know what week 17 is going to mean, guys. That could be the first preseason game where the Eagles don't play any of their starters and the Eagles have everything wrapped up, which I think there's a there's a better than average chance that they're going to have nothing to play for. And that game is going to be as meaningless to the Eagles as it was to the Cowboys. Right, well, last let's say year. they both mean something. Let's say they both mean something. Well, then I think the Eagles win both, but I don't think that it's going to mean something. So, okay. I mean, I, I think that the Eagles take care of business. They're going to be um, either having clinched home field throughout the playoffs or have the number two seed and the NFC East locked up with no chance of winning number one by week 17. And just as that game against the Cowboys meant nothing last year, I think there's a chance it means nothing this year. Last one to wrap up uh, this episode of, of Factor Fiction. I think they'll split the games. Um, I think the Eagles definitely get one and the second one probably goes to Dallas. Will Sidney Jones play this year? Fact or fiction, Elliot? We know the Ronald Darby news is starting to come out that he could be ready for this Dallas game. How about his counterpart, the guy we thought would start opposite him or maybe will start opposite him at some point in a future Eagles secondary, even though they're playing pretty well without these guys right now. Will Sidney Jones play for the Eagles in 2017? Fact or fiction that he will? Man, if you would have asked me this like three weeks ago, I would have said fact, but the the fact that he's still not practicing, and I think from when he practices, you look at how slowly they've brought along Darby. I mean, if they needed Darby, I think Darby probably plays three weeks ago. But I think the fact that their defense is playing well, they've been able to bring Darby along so slow and make sure he's 100%, make sure he gets a lot of practice time. I just think when you look at that and then the timeline, I mean, let's say – Let's just say Sydney doesn't practice till after Dallas. So he bring he's brought off the NFI after the Dallas game. Now you're looking at probably two weeks of practice time, two and a half, three weeks of practice time before they look at him as ready. And you're looking at week 14. Um, and are you going to feel comfortable playing him come playoff time? Uh, so I used to think this was fact. I still think the people around him think he's going to play. But just when I look at it, I think I'm going to have to say fiction as of now. Matt, Sidney Jones, will he be on the field for the Eagles this year? Fact or fiction, he will. Yeah, I said back during the draft when the Eagles took him, I said it back during training camp that I'd be far more surprised if Sidney Jones didn't play this year than if he did. But I just look at, at all the reasons that Elliot outlined, and I look at the fact that the secondary is playing far beyond expectations before the season began, and the fact that you're getting Ronald Darby back this week as your number one corner going into the Dallas game against Dez. And I don't think you need Sidney Jones. I think that this secondary has played really well, and if there's any chance that Sidney Jones isn't 100% fully healthy, ready to go, ready to step on the field and practice and be in there for the Bears game or even the Seahawks game, I don't see a point to bringing him back. I know that there are financial ramifications that benefit both sides if he doesn't play this year. So I think at this stage, it's fiction that Sidney Jones plays it all in 2017. He's fully healthy, fully ready to go in 2018. And there's probably a good chance that he's one of your two or three starting cornerbacks week one. Man, if that's true, they and they get through this season, have a big season without him, it just it's, you know it's a big addition for next year. If he comes back, it'd be fun to watch. 
on that side of it too. Eight and one at the bye. Eagles fans are excited. And it looks like you guys are going to be uh, on the road at some point, or maybe home, but for some playoff games, maybe on the road to Minnesota. Elliot, as always, appreciate you doing this. And uh, where are we? I-, I saw you tweet last week with our um, our reviews on, on mm-hmm. iTunes. It seems like uh, the goal was met. Am I right? Oh, yeah. The goal was met. I wanted to get to 200 by Dallas. We're at 219 right now as I'm looking. This Friday, assuming we do a podcast, we'll be Fan Friday. We'll, we'll read some of those reviews. But uh, thanks, everyone, that's been doing them. And I'm still trying to think of the next goal. So I'm not going to say what I want yet. But let's, 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 go, let's go 300 by the Ram game. I, all right. I, all right. There we all right, go. There's, there's my goal. goal. Because we yeah. have a month. We have a month until we're in the uh, L.A. Coliseum. Let's get 80 more reviews. All right, I'm going like to throw, throw out a big picture goal here, like a, a Doug Peterson type of thing. And this is just for the three of us. So we'll keep this between the three of us. All right. I think all by right. um, by the time you guys land in Minnesota for Super Bowl week, we want a thousand reviews. Oh, man. Joe. Wow. Wow. I love it. I love it. This is why you're the host. You're always leading. This is why. It's thousand reviews by Super Bowl week. And now if they get knocked out in the well, first round. Well, they're in the Super Bowl. I would hope we'll get a thousand reviews. Right, because look, that means we have a whole second half of the season. You have two playoff games. You have the, the week leading into the Super Bowl. I, I think we'll have a thousand reviews by the Super Bowl. Everyone, thanks so much for listening. Uh, Matt and Ellie will be back soon with a Fan Friday, and we'll talk to you guys uh, right here on NJ.com. <laughs>